Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for tuning in for today's discussion. I'm Congresswoman Lori Trahan, and I am thrilled to be joined by an award-winning writer and editor, Natty Khan. Her book, Young and Restless, The Girls Who Sparked America's Revolutions, tells the stories of girls and young women throughout history who have driven revolutions in our country. And what makes her work so fitting for this morning's conversation is that she opens her book with the remarkable story of the Lowell Mill Girls. The story of the Lowell Mill Girls encapsulates the first instances of women's education, women's financial freedom, and women's collective action in America. And it goes into detail about when those freedoms were threatened and they band together to form the Lowell Factory Girls Association, a de facto union. Now, this story is one many folks learned growing up in the Merrimack Valley, but it's deeply personal to me. That's because when my grandmother emigrated from Brazil to the United States, she worked in the textile mills of Lowell in the same factories where these historic movements were born. And it's no accident as to how this happened. When you look at the opportunities in Lowell and across the Merrimack Valley, it's no wonder my family put down roots when they arrived here with nothing but a desire to build a better future for their children and grandchildren. That story of immigration and opportunity is one that lots of us share. And I work to reflect that shared experience in this role as your representative. Now, if you've stopped by our congressional office in Lowell, you'll know that it's focused. Uh, it's housed in a uh, former mill right on the Merrimack River. And my grandmother's citizenship certificate is proudly displayed above my desk as a reminder of what she did for our family and how many families today want to build a legacy for future generations. I think looking back on our history and reflecting on all we have to learn from the women who came before us is instrumental as we work toward fulfilling our community's potential, particularly for women moving forward. The Mill Girls have been such an inspiration to me in my own fights for women and workers' rights and to women and young girls across our region. They understood the importance of education and independence in a world where that was a rarity for them. They also understood the power of collective action and joined together to improve their own working conditions and wages. And that's why I'm so glad to be joined this morning by an expert on this story, Maddie Kahn. Now, Maddie is an award-winning writer and editor with work published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, Harper's Bazaar, Vogue, Vox, and so many others. She was the culture director at Glamour, where she covered women's issues and politics and a staff editor at Elle. And as I mentioned at the top, she's the author of Young and Restless, The Girls Who Sparked America's Revolutions. Maddie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. What an amazing introduction. Thanks. <laughs> Your book highlights many amazing stories of young women and their activism that don't always make it into our history book. So my first question is, what inspired you to make the Lowell Mill Girls the opening chapter of your book? And, and what do you think their story encapsulates about girlhood? Yeah, such a great question. I mean, the earliest vision that I had for this book started way after the Lowell Mill Girls. I actually, through the work that I was doing at Glamour and at Elle, thought I would write a book about the history of teenage girls starting at the beginning of the idea of a teenage girl, which, as we know, sort of dates to the 40s, 50s, the 1940s, 50s, that is. Um, and it was really in conversations with my editors that she said, uh, my book editor, who said, is there a way to stretch the story back further? Is there any other point in American history where girls started to think of themselves as a kind of class, something distinct from being a child and being an adult? Um, and actually the book then became much more of a history book um, in a lot of ways. And uh, the story of the Little Mill Girls, which I guess I sort of tangentially knew, I grew up on the East Coast, um, I came to the fore in this really powerful way because Really, that's exactly what the Lowell, Lowell Mill girls did is they thought of themselves as something distinct from either childhood and womanhood. And that was really novel. I don't think for us now it's 
even possible to imagine just how radical it was for these girls to think of themselves as a shared cohort with interests that were unique to them. Um, and so it became such an obvious place to start the book because the book is, as much as it's about the history of teenage girls and activism in the US, it's also about our evolving ideas about girlhood. And I think that Lowell is in a lot of ways the birthplace of the American girl as we see it now. Oh. I love that. I mean, one part I also love about the story of the Lowell Mill girls is how unique of a situation it was, which you just described. I mean, there are very few points in American history where young women coalesced in one place in the same way. And you really visualize this in President Jackson's visit to the region where he was marveled um, by miles of girls. Yes. Could you speak more about the opportunities Lowell brought um, up for girls' education, their financial freedom, and the communities uh, these girls formed. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to remember what life was like for a farm girl living in New England in the 1820s and 30s as the mills were beginning to come into view. I mean, these are girls who would have grown up on small family farms, mm -hmm. living and working for their fathers for the most part, um, doing really backbreaking work and very isolated from other girls their age. I mean, there was no concept that that would be something that would be beneficial to girls or necessary to girls. Um, and so the mills get built and they're modeled a little bit off of the mills that exist in England at the time where child labor is rampant and the conditions in these mills is really gruesome. And the New Englanders who decide to import the model of the textile mills, which are so powerful and are creating fabric at just such a higher rate, than had been possible before, decide mm, not so crazy about the brutal child labor part of this. And what other population of people can we bring in to literally power these mills that is not going to be as brutal as what we've seen in England? And what they decide is, well, here's this kind of captive audience. We have all of these young farm girls who are capable who would love the experience of getting off of their small farms, um, who can be trusted to live and work together under the guidance of kind of boarding house mothers that are imported into Lowell um, to man the boarding houses. And they pitch it almost as like an apprenticeship or like an internship for these girls after their young childhood before they go off presumably to get married. Um, and what the mills offer the girls is not just pay, which at the very beginning in the early, you know, in the 1830s was more than those girls could have ever hoped to make at home, but also an academic environment. I mean, they have Harvard professors coming to give lectures to these girls. There is, in one of the memoirs I read from one of the girls who worked there, long paragraphs about how many books were available to them in these boarding houses, something they had never experienced before. And one of them says that she meets a girl who comes just for the books. She hears like you can access these libraries in Lowell and she wants to get off her farm and read some books. And I write in the book and I don't want to ever make it seem like this is some utopian ideal that it's all heaven. Obviously we know that they go on strike um, and that, yeah, it wasn't all paradise, but I think it is good to know that in context, the opportunities of this place were not available to girls otherwise. Um, and the opportunity to learn and work and live together and have that kind of independence was totally unprecedented. Uh, and I'll just say one more thing, which is that one of my favorite things to come across in the archive, the writing that girls did at these mills is I'm sure if you are a woman on the internet, you've probably come across uh, the sort of format of the money diaries where someone tracks their spending for a week. These girls were basically doing that at Lowell. They would have be interviewed about how they were spending their money and they were buying shoes and they were saving for education. And they were doing things that were just so far outside the realm of what they could have imagined for themselves. And it was really, yeah, a very unique experiment. Wow. Uh, and the power of community in terms of all of them uh, being together. I'm sure it compelled uh, my my next question. You know, as, as the daughter of a union iron worker, uh, I do want to touch on the importance of their story in terms of the labor movement. Uh, because while the girls, the mill girl story is inspiring, I mean, their work, as you said, it was not easy. Many of them suffered severe medical conditions due to crammed, often uh, dangerous nature of the mills that they worked in. 
But the Milk Girls were special in that they were the first union of working women in American history at a time when women couldn't even vote. Uh, so while they were unfortunately unsuccessful in their walkout, uh, could you just talk about how these girls, some of them as young as 10, contributed to the labor movement and any parallels we can draw to today, especially for women in the workforce? Yeah, I think one of the things that I found most poignant about their story is the way that their work didn't just contribute to the idea of a labor movement. I mean, we do see decades later that people are starting to pick up the tactics that these girls sort of came to spontaneously. But the way that they contributed to a kind of worker's imagination of what's possible, of what dignity means for people who work in factories or, you know, in mills. Um, and I don't think it's an accident that decades later during second wave feminism, so, you know, over a century later, when those women who are, you know, not just in favor of labor rights for women, but in favor of obviously equality for women, when they're looking back into the past and trying to find examples of people who were articulating their vision of what was possible, they publish an anthology of the writings of the Lowell Mill Girls. I mean, we're talking about women in their 30s and 40s and 50s looking to the example of girls who are 10, 11, 12, 16, wow. 17, because the way these girls articulated what they felt they were owed was so profound that even decades later, it still felt resonant. And so I think that that's certainly true. Oh, sorry. Here's my slack. I'm turning that off. Uh, I think it's certainly true for, um, for the labor movement. And we do see, you know, um, textile workers um, in New York, uh, you know, decades later, reaching back to the example of the mill girls. I think what's even more special to me is how the way that these girls articulated their consciousness became powerful for activists across all different kinds of disciplines, um, uh, like I said, over a century later. It's amazing. You know, in the past, you've called this book a love letter to teenage girls. Uh, and I know my teenage years growing up in Lowell with three sisters, you know, going to Lowell public schools, playing team sports, uh, waiting tables at the Owl Diner, it still influences much of what I do today. How did your teenage years influence this book? Oh my God, in so many ways. I mean, I think one of the luckiest things that I had as a teenage girl is people who cared to listen to me. I think for teenage girls, the feeling of being heard, which is such a consistent theme across the stories of the girls in this book, is one of the biggest gifts that adults can offer. I felt incredibly heard and valued as a teenage girl, and it reflected what I wanted to do and what I felt was possible. I mean, writing is the ultimate act of feeling like you have something to say. Uh, and I feel like a lot of the the seeds of this book came out of my own adolescence, that feeling that um, teenage girls have a kind of consciousness that should be expressed, that has you know powerful things to say about the state of the world, about where the direction in which it should go. Um, I was an activist as a teenager. I was very, very involved in um, a, an earlier version of the climate movement, super involved in safe cosmetics and, and um, advocating for greener products in our schools and in my home where I was on a crusade against my parents to throw out things that I felt were not fitting. Um, but I also think that, uh, yeah, that feeling of having something to say and people around you who care to listen to it is probably the biggest privilege that I didn't realize I was getting as a young person. Um, and I and I think that working in women's magazines for so long as I did also kept me in conversation with young women. Uh, one of the things that I recognize from this book is how easy it is for their for that gap to grow between uh, generations and how quickly you can get out of touch with what young people are thinking about and talking about. And this book in a lot of ways kept me in conversation with uh, young people and their concerns and their interests in a way that I don't ever want to give up. Oh, you, you hit so many important points in that last answer. You know, I'm the mom of two young girls entering their teenage years, and I spend a lot of time thinking about how I can best support them. And, and you just said listening to them and making sure that they feel heard. And it's that, it's something as small as, you know, what extracurricular I should sign them up for, um, you know, the, the power that we give them in our own household, getting rid of single use plastics is, is one that we've just, you know, sort of implemented with, uh, with my girls leading the charge. Um, but sometimes the policies are bigger, right? What should we be passing at the federal level? Uh, who should we be listening to globally um, as these mo movements are energized by young women? I mean, 
what do you think we have to learn from uh, young women uh, through these stories? And is there a way that you think we can best support girls growing up in America today? Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, to the first point, um, I think what you're talking about in terms of just taking into account the feelings of your daughters is actually way too rare. We see all the time legislation about children or about young people that doesn't ever correspond with or seem to reflect the realities of young people. I think one thing that came up as I was writing this book is, you know, I was editing this book after in amid the Supreme Court season that saw the fall of Roe. And um, it was devastating for the girls that I spoke to for the book, the feeling of being at the whims of policymakers who aren't hearing from you about your lived experience is a frightening place to be as a young person. Many of the girls that I write about in this book are not old enough to vote. You know, I mean, th thankfully now the voting age is 18 and that enfranchised so many young women and let them have a voice at the ballot box. But a lot of the girls in this book, those low mill workers, you know, who are 10 or 11, um, we have moved past, hopefully not entirely the age of that kind of child labor, but those are not people who can ever have a voice politically in that way. And so I think any effort to involve young women in the political process, whether that's, you know, giving them speaking time at a school board meeting or um, taking them into account and their testimonies into account when it comes to legislation about reproductive rights, I think it's very tempting to do things on behalf of children without actually speaking to young people. Um, and that's something that comes up again and again in, in the book. I mean, in terms of what we can learn from young people, the list is incredibly long. I think uh, the book is always exploring that tension between the conviction that young people have, which anyone who's been a teenager knows what it's like to discover your ideals for the first time and to feel that the difference between right and wrong is so stark. Mm -hmm. I think that power, there's tremendous power in that kind of conviction. And then Luckily, that's also balanced over time with experience and resilience, which I think um, is it can be a real challenge for young activists, the sense that it's so obvious what needs to be done. And yet we all know it takes a long time to get to the place of achievement and progress. And so I think what older people can offer younger people is be inspired by their conviction and help them see that these movements for change are part of a long game um, and that we all need to keep chipping away, even if it feels like progress should happen so much faster. So you, I, you may or may not know this, but I first ran for office because after a career as a congressional staffer and in the private sector, you know, helping to empower women in the workplace, I did look around Congress and knew uh, there still weren't enough women in office, right? This was in 2018 when lots of women had the same thought bubble across the country as I had. And now I get to serve with some of the most incredible women I've ever met. Um, but still, less than 30% of the House of Representatives is made up of women, and we still lack the perspective of girls and young women. And it really is a feeling collectively amongst us that we have to make room for more women, right? And we need to accelerate, uh, you know, having more women in this very important representative body. You talked about, you know, um, how lawmakers stand to learn from young women. I'm wondering, do you have any ideas for how to accelerate um, more women moving into positions of leadership um, because of those uh, you know, conversations and, and just in general empowerment of, of young girls. Yeah. I mean, I think this is part of one of the things that's a little bit painful about this book, which is we can see that actually for centuries, America has really valued in some ways the voices of young women and that young women have become sensations in this country from the Lowell Mill girls who completely obviously captured the imagination of presidents and writers who came to see them work to women like Anne Elizabeth Dickinson, who was a famous abolitionist speaker during the Civil War. And then we see that it is quite difficult for these girls who have a, you know, a real podium and a real platform to talk to adults all across the country to make the transition to being women who are equally valued. Uh, I find it to be really sad that uh, so many of these girls felt as soon as they became women, their opportunities dried up. 
I think if you, especially you as someone who serves in political office, you can imagine the difference between a girl who's giving a political speech and cries and captures the emotion of the nation. And we have seen that happen on live television over the past few years. And what happens when a woman who is seeking a position of uh, political office, what might happen if she cried? You know, we yeah. do not accept the same emotional bandwidth from women that we valorize in girls. And I think for girls that I spoke to for this book, including today, where we have made a lot of progress, like you said, in terms of the opportunities for women, they are still very conscious of that. Their anger and their emotions, which are prized in their adolescence and considered signs of just how seriously they take these issues, are not tolerated in the same way um, in women. And I think I'm sure you know acutely, probably better than I do, how dangerous it is for women who are seeking elected office or seeking positions of power to express their rage, you know, no matter how deeply felt. Um, and so I think one of the things that the book made me realize is in terms of the emotional expression, the authentic emotional expression that we um, love to see in young women, it's something we still don't have uh, total acceptance for among grown women. And if we're ever going to achieve the kind of parity that we want to see in political office, in, in, in the business sector, anywhere in this country, we're going to have to learn that those kind of authentic modes of expression should be available to women and should be, um, yeah, a sign of just how seriously they're taking this critical work. I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, I would say women, um, because of their empathy, because of their authenticity, because of their uh, the logic that they bring, uh, allows us to build trust uh, in ways uh, with the people that we represent. Um, Absolutely. It's really powerful. Um, and so it is on us to make sure that uh, people can just be who they are uh, and command, you know, the, the leadership that, you know, men have enjoyed for generations. Look, Maddie, I could sit and talk with you for hours about all the amazing stories in your book and the importance of girl-led movements. I mean, you've been so generous to join me for this important discussion, and I just want to say thank you. Uh, and thanks for everybody, uh, you know, to um, who joined us. But you're shedding light on the stories of young women who don't always find their way into the history books. Uh, is is just critical. Uh, I know I speak for everyone tuning in right now when I say how much we appreciate you uh, being here to speak on this topic and, and give us an inside look into this fantastic book. And of course, uh, just thank you for everyone tuning in to learn more about the history of the Mill City and what we can learn from the girls who came before us. This was a terrific conversation, especially as a mom of young girls. I feel more inspired than ever about what their futures have in store, what my role is in that future. And if you have any questions about what we touched upon during this conversation or would like to learn more, please don't hesitate to drop a comment in the chat so that we can get back to you. I look forward to keeping all of you updated on my own fight in Congress for the rights of women and working families everywhere. So thank you all again for joining us, Maddie. Thank you. So great to meet you. Thank you for having me.